last week, things got a little lit during Wednesday night Bible study. If you were here last week, make some noise. If you were here, caught it on YouTube. If you weren't here, make some noise. It's all right. We're not judging. Okay, I'm going to catch you guys up who weren't here. So the text that I used was Genesis 24 and 1, if you put that on the screen for me. My message last week was Mission Unstoppable. And I only got about halfway through the message, and so I'm going to recap a little bit. Maybe you were here. Maybe there were some things that you missed. To set the scene, we have Abraham. Everyone knows Abraham, the father of many nations, preparing to die. Abraham is on his deathbed. He has been promised that he will be the father of many nations, yet he only has one son. Has God ever made you a promise, but it didn't look like what you had in your hand was what he promised you? He tells Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, yet he only has one son. And so when we find him in the text, this is a very pivotal scene because he's going to use his head servant to locate a wife for his one son. And he gives him very specific instructions. And as I was studying, I found this just so fascinating because everything hung in the balance to a servant. Seemingly the person who would be counted out, who would have no power at all, the one who perhaps all the odds were against, who was just supposed to do like every other servant had always done, he was trusted with multiplying Abraham's legacy. And it was such a powerful word for me because I recognized that there were people in the room last week who saw themselves as servants, but not in the way that we see Abraham's servants, but as servants who have been counted out. People wondering how their destinies were going to be manifest. And so we named this Mission Unstoppable because I needed you all to recognize the power in service. And so I use Chick-fil-A as an example because I'm on a diet and just everything looks good when you're on a diet. And no, they did not run me a check, even though my YouTube views are up there. Chick-fil-A did not send me any coins. But I use the example of Chick-fil-A because... Chick-fil-A has separated itself from any other fast food restaurant because they have been intentional about their service. And when you are intentional about your service, you don't have to do things the way everyone else does it because you know that you're not just out here living your life for whoever, but you have a mission. You have this mission, and when you know what your mission is, you can't let anyone stand in your way. And so Chick-fil-A makes so much revenue that they can afford to close on Sunday and still compete with their competitors because when you're in your lane... And so the question is, then, how do we find our lane? And I believe in this text, we see a servant trying to discover his lane. And it says, now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, which was a sign of covenant at the time. And verse 3 continues, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son. You see, he didn't want for him to take his son back to the place where he was from. So he had to send a servant to pull something out of where he was from into where he was going. And that's so significant because some of us have to recognize that when God pulls us out of something, that he's not just pulling us out, that he's pulling our children's 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 children out of generational curses out of. There are some things that are going to be broken off with you so much so that when God pulls you out, your children aren't going to have to go through that thing that you went through. And that's why God had to choose you to struggle because he knew that when he broke this thing for you, that he was going to break it for everything connected to you you when he calls Abraham out of his father's land Abraham recognized that his child could not go back 
and that anyone connected to him would have to elevate to where he was. He said, you can go find him a wife, find him a wife, but you're going to have to pull her out of her comfort zone. You're going to have to pull her out of what has been safe and normal for her because when you're connected to me, everything must be elevated. And the problem with so many of us is that we go back to situations that God pulled us out of thinking we can elevate someone, but God never told us to go back. He said, you stay where you are, and if you're supposed to be with that person, I'll send someone for them. But you stay in your position because I can't trust you back where you were yet. You're not strong enough back where you were yet. So when I pulled you out, don't go looking back. If that relationship, if that opportunity, if that door was meant for you, I'll send someone to bring it to you. Isn't God so good that he brings things to us? He brings things to us because he recognizes that in our own strength, we may go back and stay where he pulled us out of, so instead... He sends someone for us. And so he says, go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son. Isaac, verse 5, continues, and the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. So the servant says, okay, here's the problem, though. What if she won't follow me? And I shared this last week, and I told them that whenever God calls you to do something, that you should expect resistance. Because what this servant was saying is, I understand what you've called me to do, but he knew that what he called him to do wasn't going to be easy, so he started thinking in advance of issues that may spring up. And when we start strategizing on potential issues, then God's able to give us the ability to maneuver when obstacles come our way. See, when God gives us a promise, we think we're just going to walk into that promise, that there's not going to be any issues or any struggles. So when things start getting shaky, we start questioning the promise. But if you learn to expect resistance... You won't be surprised when people can't be connected to you any longer. You won't be surprised when doors start closing because you recognize that your master sent you on a mission and resistance was a part of the deal. That You recognize that nothing comes without persecution, so I'm not surprised you're talking about me, but you don't let that distract you from your mission. I'm not surprised that you don't get me, that you don't understand me, that you can't connect with me the way you used to connect with me because I was expecting a little bit of resistance. I knew that once I got into alignment that it was going to break some things off of me. I was expecting you to hate on me just a little bit. I was expecting for you to not get me just a little bit. I learned to expect resistance. So I put my faith in God and the one who sent me. And so anything that comes up against me, I know it's not going to prosper. So let your resistance come. Just know that I'm on a mission. And this mission is unstoppable regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of whether or not you agree with it, that I know God sent me to do something and I'm going to live the right way and I'm going to speak the right way and I'm going to have faith for what he's called me to do. And not everyone's going to get that. So my ser the servant here in the text begins looking for areas of resistance. And so Abraham tells him, don't take my son back no matter what. You know, if the woman's not willing to come, then I will release you from this vow. And then I picked up in verse 14, I believe it was, because the servant loads up the camels and he loads up some other men with him and he begins to make the journey to Abraham's hometown. Mind you, it's not like Abraham told, told him she's got to have brown hair. You know, find her on Match.com. You're going to know it's her because she has on a red sweater and one eye is bigger than the other. He had no idea <laughs> what his promise was supposed to look like. But he still started moving in the direction of the promise. He was moving and wondering at the same time. And that's what happens to us when God calls us to do something. He never reveals the full picture. He just wants to see if our feet will move without all the answers. And so 
we see a servant on a mission unclear of how he's going to actually fulfill it, yet he didn't let that keep him from moving. He was moving and wondering. Moving and questioning, do I have what it takes? Moving and, and wondering if they're going to receive me when I get there. Will I be accepted? Will I still have friends? Will the bank account come? He was moving and wondering. Am I qualified? When I get in the room, will they listen to me? Will they recognize that I'm more than what I look like on the outside, that there's something down on the inside of me? He had to move in the direction of his purpose and wonder. But there's something so powerful about recognizing who sent you. Because he recognized above anything that whether they accepted him or not, that he had the name Abraham attached to his destiny. And that when he got in the room that he would be able to say that my master, the master, the one who sent me, this is who he is and this is what he's accomplished and he's put me in a, on a mission so when I get in the room I'm not afraid. I may be wondering, I may be questioning, but something happens when we remember who has sent us. When we remember the master who put the gifts and put the talent down on the inside of us, when we remember the person who opened the door in the first place, when we remember that we didn't get here by ourselves, that we're surviving not by our own grace, but because there is a divine plan and a divine strategy, something happens to your anxiety when you remember your master. Something happens to your depression when you remember your master. Something happens to fear when you recognize who sent you. It's like a black American Express card. Come on, somebody. Won't he do it? I pray into that right now. Did you know that with the black American Express cards that you can get stores to open when they're closed? Because they recognize who granted you the access. And somebody needs to remember before this night is over that God's faith in them is all of the credit they need in the room. That when they go into situations, they don't need to be well-connected or well-educated. All of that, those are cherries on top because what God has really done has given you the grace to do what he's called you to do. You are unstoppable in your lane. No one is messing with you in your lane. There is no competition in your lane. When you do what God has called you to do, no one can do it like you. So you don't have to be jealous or envious when you see people doing well because you recognize that's great for them. They're in their lane, but about this thing that God has called me to do. And so the servant gets there and he says, now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So the servant says a prayer to God. If this is what's supposed to happen, let it happen this way. And I love verse 15. And this is when everybody got hype and we had to shut the message down because it said, and it happened before he had finished speaking. That before he had even finished the prayer, that Rebecca comes into the environment. And what got us so excited was that there were no arrows or signs pointing towards Rebecca, but his prayer was in the room. And because his prayer was in the room, his miracle was in the room too. He just didn't realize it. And the reason why that blessed us so much is because some of us have been wondering whether or not we're in the room. And God just spoke so profoundly last Wednesday that you're already in the proper position, that you're already in the room before you had even finished your prayer, that God had started opening doors and bringing people into the room. You may not see it, but he saw it. You may not recognize it, but he saw it. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca, she was in the room and she came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And then I want to pick up at verse 21 
because the, between 16 and 21, it goes down exactly as he prayed. He asked her for a little bit of water. She gave him water and camels water. And that, that was another point from last week is what the servant really prayed was that the person who was connected to his destiny would serve in such a way that she was willing to go the extra step. And as a servant, this was so incredible because basically what he asked for was for the person who was connected to his destiny to be of the same heart as him, to be a servant as well. And I just believe that God is going to bring people into your lives, into our lives, into our circles and environments who recognize service in such a way that they match your service that they match what you put out in the environment, that the days of us giving and giving to people until they overdraft us and don't recognize that what we gave them was the best of what we had was over, that God was going to start bringing people as we were on our mission who understood that this that I'm serving you, I didn't get this cheaply, so you need to value this. You need to take care of this. This is my hard blood, sweat, and tears. These are my experiences and my wisdom, and I cannot cast my pearls among swans. So God, please bring people into our lives who recognize service, who aren't just about what they can get from us and how they can use us and abuse us, but they recognize that we're treasures. Maybe we're not perfect. Maybe we haven't done everything the right way, but still there's a treasure down on the inside of us. And when you really start to believe that you don't just hand yourself out so cheaply, you start recognizing when someone doesn't see you the way they're supposed to see you. And so the servant, he prayed such an incredible prayer. He said, let her be like me. And, and everything happened just as he prayed. And then we didn't get into verse 21, so we're going to pick up from here. And the man wondering at her remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And I wondered how this servant prayed that God would do something. And then when God did it exactly as he prayed, he stayed silent. He stayed silent. Has God ever started answering your prayers and then you was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know you were actually going to do that. Now I have to become the person who's capable of living in this role that you opened up for me. I didn't. And at first, I, well, he should be rejoicing, he should be celebrating, but he remained silent. And I recognize that sometimes God requires our silence. That he wants to know that we don't want what we want so badly that we start celebrating at the first sign of our miracle. There was something about him remaining silent so as to know that he didn't just grab it because it was available and it looked like everything he ever wanted, that he didn't just move so quickly that he lost everything in the process. He was willing to say, God, is this really you? I know it looks like what I prayed for. I know it talks like what I prayed for. I know it sounds like what I prayed for, but I'm, I need confirmation on this because if it's not you, I don't want it. I don't care how much it looks like what you're doing in my life. I don't care how much it looks like what I prayed for. I don't want the deal if it has strings attached. I don't want the doors if it means that I have to kiss a ring when I get in there. I want to know, is this really you? And it's not that I don't believe you're capable. I just want to be sure. The text told us in verse 21 that he just wanted to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. He was willing to stay there a little bit longer if it wasn't the right one. He was willing to stay on that level. He was willing to be empty handed if that wasn't what God had for him. We cannot be so desperate for the validation of success. 
and the validation of having certain people in our lives that we snatch things before God has confirmed whether or not it was for us or not. We cannot be so desperate to look like everyone else. To look like we have it together like everyone else. We can't be so desperate that we start grabbing things that don't have our names on it. Because the truth is, some of the people we admire for what they have snatch things that were never theirs to begin with. And so we're jealous over a lifestyle that's actually causing them misery when doors close because it didn't have their name attached to it. You don't know really what you're envious of, so it's better that you sit in silence so as to know. So the servant, he waits and he gets confirmation from the Lord and he asks Rebecca, you know, where are you from? What, what's your mama and them's name? Do they make cornbread on Thanksgiving? You know, like really making sure she had all the proper qualities. And so she takes him back to her parents' home her father and mother and brother, they all agree that this is of the Lord. And so they say, you know, we agree with you. You take it. Everything is coming into alignment. And then something happens in verse 55. And you all, when you get in your own time, read all of the chapter. It's incredible. But this is what kind of shook me. Because everyone was on the same page about how things were supposed to go. They said, Rebecca, pack your bags and, and head out. This is from the Lord. We won't argue with what God is doing. And then I recognize something tricky that happens when you are on a mission. And that is that we have to learn to navigate betrayal. Because it says, but her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days. The very people who said this was from God, when it was actually time to go, tried to sabotage the mission. The very people you never thought you'd have to say goodbye to. The very people you, you never thought would betray you, the very people who you thought would always have your back, the very people who you thought would be your number one cheerleader, the very people who prayed for you and said, God, really do something in their life. And then the moment it was time for her to actually step into that thing, they started holding her back and not because they were evil. This is the tricky thing about betrayal is that we think that the only people who can hurt you are people who are evil. And that's why we're shocked when people who we thought were good start hurting us. It's not because they weren't good. It's just that some people can't move with you to the next place. Some people can't fully understand who you're going to be on the next level. And so they hold on to who you were before. Because it's all they understand. It's who you were before. And so we find ourselves torn between who we once were and who God is calling us to be. And these people, they're close. If it would have been just a maid servants or, or just a farmer in the field who was saying, let her stay. But no, this was her brother and her mother who couldn't bear to see her change. And that's what happens to us when we step into certain roles and in certain capacities. Sometimes answering the call of God on your life makes you lonely. It leaves you in a position where you knew you were going to have to step out on faith, but at least you were going to have the support of your brother and your mother. But for some reason, right when you were about to take that step, it feels like everything started shaking around you. That right when you thought, no, I can't do this without them, that they try to convince you to stay. 
So it says, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10, bargaining with her destiny. Please, I'm not saying you can't do it, just do it my way. I'm not saying that you're not going to be successful, but you just have to be successful this way. I'm not saying that I won't let you go. I'm just saying you got to do it my way. Have you ever had somebody want you to do it your, their way, and then you have to choose whether or not you please them? and hurt you or hurt them and do what God is calling you to do. Can I be friends with the same person who I used to be out clubbing and, and doing all kinds of things with? Can I bring that person to church too or do they like me better when I'm in the club? Do they like me better when I'm broken, lost, and insecure? Or can I actually be the confident person that God has called me to be? Have you ever had someone hold you? Try to convince you that you can live both ways. You can still go. You can still do it. Just, just kick it with me on the side. That was personal for somebody who wanted to talk about that. <laughs> Sometimes when we make transitions, it means that someone has to mourn who we were in their life. And we have to be willing to allow them to hold a funeral for the memory of who we were so that God can resurrect who he's called us to be. Somebody's going to have to say goodbye to the old Sarah because the new Sarah has to believe a certain way. She has to act a certain way. She has to talk a certain way. And I know you're used to me talking kind of crazy, and I know you're used to me doing things a little differently, but for where God is calling me, I had to shed some dead skin off of me. I had to shake some things off of me, and I can't afford to be a double-minded man in this season. I got to bring all of my faith into this mission. I got to bring all of my wisdom into this season. I got to bring all of my experience experience into this season. I can't be who you need me to be and be who God called me to be at the same time. So allow me to reintroduce myself. Can you be connected to where God is moving me to be? Can you be connected? I know you know who I was, but as God is grooming me and growing me, if you're gonna stay connected to me, you gotta be able to move when he says move. You gotta be able to be silent when he says be silent. You gotta put all of your faith. If you're connected to me, I need your faith on my destiny. If you're connected to me, I need you prophesying godly things over me. I need you prophesying the word of the Lord over my life. If you are gonna be connected to me, my faith needs to be stronger when I'm connected to you. If you're going to be in my circle, you got to recognize that we think on a certain level. We think on destiny levels. We think on kingdom level. We think on light chasing darkness kind of level. We think on breaking generational curses kind of level. We think on he, he crucified and rose three days later. So there's nothing that can stand in my way. We think on a certain level. We don't take no where I'm from. We only take yeses sent from God. I want to know. if you can do things on my level. And I love verse 56 because the servant continued, continues talking to them after they've told him that we want her to stay a few days. And he says to them, do not hinder me. And when I first read this, I thought he was begging them to not stand in the way. Then I read it a little differently. <laughs> and I realized he was warning them that if you hinder me, since the Lord has prospered me, this is not going to end well for you. So sometimes when people tell you no, you, you have to tell them in your heart and in your mind, you may not want to hinder me because I know who sent me and he's already prospered my journey. 
which means that no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. So I know you think you just shut me down, but you may have just shut your business down because I would have added something to you. I know you think you just broke my heart and walked away with pieces of me, but you actually just played yourself because I know who sent me. And everything you thought you took away from me, God is going to restore, and he's going to do it right in your view. So I know... This isn't about me. This is about you. Do, don't hinder me. Don't hinder me. <laughs> I'm from Texas. We say stuff like, don't fool with me. Because I'm in my destiny. I'm in my purpose. I know who sent me. I know angels are dispatched to me. Don't, don't fool with me. Don't, don't. This is not about me. This is about you. Every tongue that rises against you. It would be better for you if you learned to be a bit more respectful when dealing with me. Because I am the righteousness of God. Because I know who my master is. Because I know that he wouldn't get me this far and leave me. So I know it may look like you have the upper hand right now and that you're going to throw a wrench into the plane that God has gone, but I want you to know that your no has nothing to do with his yes. That your no has nothing to do with his yes. And because he has already said yes, he may not do it through you, but it's going to get done. It's going to get done. It's going to get done. Because he said it, because he sent you, because he's prospered you, because grace has been hovering over you from the day you were born, because some of you should be dead and in your grave, because some of you should be in cities where you don't even see any lights, because some of you should be broken and depressed and in mental hospitals, because some of you shouldn't have even made it this far, because broken homes should have broke you down, but you still believe in love, because some of you should be in jail cells and tied up but God put you in a situation where he prospered you even when you were wondering when he prospered you even before you fully recognized who you were that he was prospering you even when you were hurting you he was prospering you even when you weren't sure who you were he was prospering you he was getting words to you he was putting seeds down on the inside of you and now he's waiting for you to recognize who you truly are. But more importantly, who sent you? Do not hinder me. Don't stand in my way. Don't stand in my way. It, it's not even about me not wanting to overcome the obstacles. It's about the obstacle recognizing who sent me. Don't hinder me. Don't hinder me. Finances, some of you need to start speaking to your finances and say, don't hinder me. Some of you need to start speaking to your situation and prophesying, don't hinder me because I know who sent me. Some of you need to start speaking into your marriages and speaking into your children, don't hinder me. Don't hinder me. Don't stop me. I'm on a mission and it's unstoppable and God's faith is backing me up. Don't hinder me. I'm going to do everything he told me I was supposed to do. Don't hinder me. Don't stop me. So he says, send me away so that I may go back to my master. And so they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. And this is when destiny was up to Rebecca. And they called Rebecca. And Rebecca, and they asked, will you go with this man? And his mission, his miracle, the one thing he was assigned to do said, I will go. It overcame the obstacle. So at the same time he was trying to get her, she was being prepared to leave. Right now, some of you are being faced with obstacles. 
and you're having to muster the kind of faith that says, don't hinder me. And it doesn't come easy every day. There are some days where it feels like anything could stop you. Not one more thing I can't take, one more disappointment, not one more no. I'm giving this my all. Please, please, please. And you come here and we say, don't let anything stand in your way. And it gives you enough fuel for one week, but you got to come back in here because you need to refill off of that faith. And as you are gathering the courage to tell your mountain to move, your miracle is saying, I will go. The two of you are in alignment. You're just waiting for the paths to cross. The need for your gift, the need for your voice, the need for your love, the need is already there, but on the other side of that obstacle, the miracle is still getting ready. And it takes time and it takes commitment, but more importantly, it takes persistent faith. It takes the kind of faith that says, regardless of what's going on, don't hinder me. I want you to stand with me as I prepare to close. Because someone just recognized that they have the ability to tap into faith that they didn't even know was possible. If they would just remember who sent them, if they would remember their master, they don't have to be afraid of their mountain. If you would remember your master, then you don't have to be afraid of your mountain. And the problem is some of us have had masters with many different names. We've allowed insecurities to be our master, toxic relationships to be our master, ambition that was rooted in, in insecurities to be our master. The world's definition of success has become our master. Riches and fame have become our master. We've had all of these different masters and that's why it's so easy to give up because that master will not open doors for you. That master will not give you peace. That master will not give you joy. But if you would remember the name above all names, in the middle of your despair, if you would remember the master that has never left you nor forsaken you, the master that spared your life when everyone else could have given up, the master that got depression up off of you, the master that has you coming into service on a Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, the master that brought you to Los Angeles, the master that protected you in your mother's womb, the master that said, no, not my child, the master that put a roof over your head, put food in your stomach, the master that said, I know you're being forsaken, it feels like right now, but I'm actually just building you up so when you get there, you can stay longer, if you would remember your master, your mountain would lose its power and you would start speaking to that thing. Do not hinder me. We want to have a moment of prayer at this altar for people who are trying to muster up the kind of faith where they can look at their marriages, where they can look at their children, when they can look at their destiny, where they can look at book deals, where they can look at movies and say, I'm not hindered by what I don't have. I'm empowered by who sent me. People who are trying to find the courage to live this thing out for God with such ambition and such power and such strength that they don't care what stands in their way. All that matters to them is that they have insurance in the one who sent them. And for some of you, this may just be another Wednesday night, another feel good message, but for someone else, this is a, a life changing moment. If you don't have to go, please don't go. Because I believe what happens at this altar is gonna break chains off of people. That where two or three are gathered in his name, that he's not only gonna be in the mist, 
but we're going to start chasing anxiety out of Hollywood, that we're going to start chasing alcoholism out of Hollywood, that drug addiction can no longer exist in this room, that infidelity can't exist, that broken hearts can't remain. What's going to happen at this altar is going to clear the vision. It's going to clear the vision of people in such a way that they recognize with such clarity who sent them and why they are unstoppable. They're gonna recognize regardless of what they're up against, that they know what's working down on the inside of them is greater than any of that. So they don't have to be afraid any longer. You're not in this thing on your own. You may be the only one in the room that you can see, but the spirit of the Lord is hovering. Angels have gone ahead. The crooked path has been made straight. No one has walked away from you who you need to continue going. Nothing has been taken away from you that you need to keep progressing. And it makes you feel naked and vulnerable and uncomfortable and unworthy and inadequate and anxious and afraid and depressed and all of these negative things. But we're gonna break that off of you because when you recognize who your master is, those things cannot have control over you any longer. When you live in the consciousness of who your master is, you don't bow down to fear or anxiety. You don't bow down to depression because you recognize who your master is. God starts to do something down on the inside of you that renews your mind and changes the way you look at things. Pastor. Hallelujah. And so, profoundly and eloquently and masterfully, God, through your first lady, has proven that he has done spiritual kung fu on everything that stands between you and your destiny. He has gone ahead of you and made your crooked path straight. Isn't, isn't this what Jesus did? God made him, Christ, who knew no sin. What is sin? Hermitima, missing the mark. Weakness, opposition, difficulty, struggle, warfare. He made him who knew no sin become sin. That which makes you miss the mark. And then, after he made him become your opposition, become your obstacle, he crushed it in his body. Put it to death once and for all, was raised up proving that he had the power and the victory over all those things. And then it says he went and he sat down, seated at the right hand of the Father. And now I see Jesus at your finish line. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which would so easily ensnare us. That's powerful. Let us lay aside. In other words, get this out of the way. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which would so easily ensnare us. We're being easily ensnared by things that Jesus has killed already. And then it says, let us run with endurance with perseverance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Where is he? He's at the finish line. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega. And he has cleared the path of everything in between. 
And because all of this has happened, like Rebecca says, we say tonight, I'll go. Because there's nothing that can stop me because I have a mission that is unstoppable because everything that could stop me got crushed in my Lord's body. Are you tracking with me? Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for this word. I hear it. You've chosen me. You called me. You've gone ahead of me. You've cleared the path. So the lane is all mine. I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making him who had no sin, all my sin. No music, please. Thank you for making him who had no sin, all of mine, all of my obstacles, all of my limitations, everything that would stand in my way, you placed in his body, nailed it to the cross, and once and for all, put it to death, broke the yoke, destroyed the yoke. And as he was raised up, I declare tonight that I'm raised up. Far above every hindering principality. And from this moment forward, I'll live in my high place, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher.